Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. On average, we exchange air 25,000 times a day, so often that we seldom think about it. But when we run into something that interferes with this automatic activity, then we notice it. We'll take your questions tonight about breathing and acute care in the emergency room. Okay, first let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Is this a true or a false statement? A person with emphysema, now commonly called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and a person with asthma, both have trouble pushing the air out of the lungs, but not so much trouble getting the air into their lungs. True or false? Call in or email your answer now. We'll take quiz answers for only the next 10 minutes of our show. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of A Picture of Health. This book was written by me with accompanying photographs by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. And call in a question at the same time. We answer your questions about the respiratory system or the emergency room as they're called in or sent to us via face mail or email, call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email. Join us tonight. Joining us tonight are two guests from Yankton, South Dakota, Dr. Michael Pietela of the Yankton Medical Clinic and Dr. Benjamin Aker of the Avera Medical Group Emergency Medicine, Yankton. Two Yankton, Yanktonian guys. Now, you don't live in Yankton, though. I live in Brandon. Yeah. So do, you, you do travel. An hour and a half commute there. Ooh. It's a bit of a drive. But I listen to podcasts, get all kinds of medical information uh, on the way there and back. It's great. I, you know, that, I used to do that when I was going back and forth in Atlanta. It took about an hour to get to work and an hour home. I did not know you were in Atlanta for a while. Yeah, a long time. Eight years. A little bit warmer. Then. Found a wife. It was a good thing. <laughs> She's a good wife. Yeah. So... Tell us, Ben, we're going to talk a little bit about where you train, where you're from, a little bit about you. Well, it's great to be back on the show. I'm uh, originally from Spearfish. Well, Pier, original to that, but Spearfish is where I grew up. And my folks are still out there watching the show tonight, right now. Uh, Shout love to out go to back. Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad, Don and Sheila, thanks for watching. Um, so uh, then after that, went to University of South Dakota uh, for undergrad. But uh, I always kind of thought I wanted to be an emergency physician and felt like I needed to have more and more patients, bigger area, all the trauma that comes with that. So yeah. went down to Omaha for University of Nebraska for medical school, and then down to Dallas, Texas at Parkland Hospital. For Ooh, where President Kennedy medicine. was brought in. Yes, a little bit before my time, but there's still a plaque on the wall down there and a yeah. lot of memorial. Yeah. Got a new hospital down there now, though. Yeah, I, I interviewed at Parkland looking at a residency, and the respiratory the pulmonology was a oh, big man. thing at the time, actually. Uh, Mike, you're, what, tell us about your story. Well, I'm from just down the road in Lake Norton, South Dakota. Um, and speaking of that, I want to say happy birthday to my grandmother who's watching in Watertown at her uh, assisted living facility. Um, happy birthday, Arlene. She's 94 as of yesterday. And then one other congratulations, my daughter, oldest one, got her driving permit today. So, so this we, is a big day. We're going to have a driver in the family. And, and I, I'll add that my daughter just bought a truck. It's a little older, but uh, congratulations on your purchase of your first vehicle. So yeah. there you go. But go ahead. Well, and I went to South Dakota State University um, and then on to the University of South Dakota School of Medicine. And then I trained at the Mayo Clinic in internal medicine, pulmonary, and critical care medicine. This is my 10th year in Yankton I'm doing pulmonary, critical care, sleep medicine, and I do some internal medicine as well. And both of you are... are uh, our old hands at uh, being on the show, and I appreciate your your willingness to be here. And and of course, we know each other through the State Medical Association, and yes. you know lots of things. So thank you both for being on the show. Sure. So this is today. Is what's special about today? Besides your daughter's uh, right, and yesterday, and and what has something to do with pulmonary the medicine? Great American Smokeout Correct. today. Yeah. So what is that? Well, it's, you know, it's a push towards, well, the whole month of November has been declared COPD month. I don't know if you saw Governor Dugard signed a 
proclamation regarding that and if you're on social media Facebook and Twitter and some of those there's a lot of talk about um, World COPD Day which was yesterday and then the month of November being about COPD and that encompasses then the great American smoke out which we've been doing for years the little button that says kiss me I don't smoke has a frog on it we used to wear with a little heart um, and so it's all about you know, the number one preventable cause of chronic lung disease, emphysema and COPD, as you mentioned earlier, um, is smoking, awareness, never starting, and then helping those who start to stop. Quit. Yeah. Ben, tell us again about COPD, the definition of COPD versus emphysema, or are they the same thing? Well, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, is a kind of a more general term that encompasses a lot of different uh, respiratory diseases that cause an obstructive process versus a restrictive process. So what does that mean? Well, obstructive process, something that's blocking your ability to move the air. And when we're talking about emphysema or even asthma, it's um, something that makes it difficult to get that air uh, moving out when you need to. So here's a picture uh, that we have of a person who's been a smoker. I don't know if you can show that picture that we have. Uh, this is a smoker's lung. How would you describe that, Mike? So um, again, I'll just point out a couple of things. I don't know if you can, but the trachea is the is the uh, okay. yeah the structure at the top where the air travels. Not a very in. good drawer. With That's this. fine. <laughs> travels into the lungs. We have a right lung and a left lung. On the right, we have three lobes, and on the left, we have two. And normal lungs look pink and healthy. Um, they're well perfused, have lots of blood flow, and and as you see in these lungs, they're not pink or healthy appearing. They're dark, almost charcoal looking. And essentially what smoke does is it, uh, from smoking cigarettes or other pollution, particulate matter, other forms of smoke, damage the airway and the lungs themselves and, and create this appearance. All right, I'm gonna go back, see if I can show a normal lung. No, yeah, not there, let's can. try. This is, uh, this is just drawings that we're gonna to use today. That's it, we don't have, they're nice and normal and pink. Right. So there we have. So a smoker's lung, you know, you when you do the autopsy on a smoker's lung, it is it's it's not as it's worse than the picture that we, we were looking at. It I mean, is. It's it's a it's a scary thing. People really don't realize what they're doing with the smoking. Mm -hmm. So that what you talked about rest, restrictive lung disease. Let's explain to people what restrictive lung is versus the obstructive lung disease of emphysema or am asthma. Well, so as an emergency physician, I should probably defer this question to Mike, the pulmonologist, to answer it. Um, what I know is that, you know, that really is something that's happening intrinsic to the lungs itself and making them difficult to expand. So tell me if I'm it's correct different. there, Mike. No, you're, you're on the right track. So when we talk about um, COPD, which is chronic bronchitis and emphysema, as well as asthma potentially, and then other conditions that cause airflow obstruction, I don't get air out well. Um, we differentiate it from restrictive lung disease, which is a, a consequence of shrinking lungs, basically. And lungs can shrink for, for a variety of reasons from you know, musculoskeletal changes. As we get older and our spine curves and our lungs get stiffer, that creates some restriction. Farmer's lung and fibrotic conditions, scarring of the lungs cause um, restriction. Pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah, pulmonary fibrosis, we term it as they're scarring. Um, and then conditions like neuromuscular disease, patients that might have you know, ALS or myotonic dystrophy or muscular diseases that result in so chest wall shrinking. Or... Yeah, shrinking lungs is a good way to think of restriction. In obstructive conditions, we trap air, our lungs actually become hyperexpanded. We don't get air out well. In restrictive diseases, you don't get enough air in because your lungs are shrinking, basically. Right. Uh, heart failure and pneumonia, mm -hmm. they're also causes of restrictive lung disease. So, um, well, let's, let's uh, we've got a 50-year-old, 52-year-old woman from Wagner talk about Strider, explain how it happens. You just talked to me today yeah. about making a diagnosis of a person with Strider. What, what's the difference between Mm -hmm. asthma and strider. Yeah, so when we describe lung sounds, we talk about inspiratory sounds. When I'm breathing in, <gasps> certain trouble, whether versus when I'm breathing out, certain <sighs> trouble. And, and the common um, thing is wheezing. That's an expiratory sound primarily. <sighs> you can wheeze on inspiration too, but it's a, it's a forced, high-pitched musical sound when I try to, to breathe out. out. Um, strider's different. You know, when we think of like kids who have croup, 
the parainfluenza virus, tracheolaryngitis, and that croupy cough, <gasps> and they fight to get air in. Um, it's the same in patients who have vocal cord problems. It can be because of paralysis or thickening or uh, other unusual things. There's a condition known as vocal cord dysfunction where patients, when they feel like they can't get enough air, inappropriately allow their vocal cords to close as they breathe in as opposed to open. And they'll make a strider or a sound, which is <gasps> a high-pitched sound on breathing in. And the harder they fight to breathe in, the worse they make it. And that's the difference between strider, inspiratory, I can't get that air through my vocal cords, versus wheezing, which is air I just out. can't get the air out yeah. when I need to. So it's interesting, a, a classic board question is, uh, when you have an obstruction that's above the chest cavity, mm -hmm. then you can't get the air in. Correct. When that obstruction is below the chest cavity, below the vocal cords, mm -hmm. in the down there, then you can't get the air out. Yeah, so we talk extrathoracic versus intrathoracic obstruction. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and you had a case. I've had two cases this week. Of strider. Of strider. And the causes were? Um, I think in both instances, vocal cord dysfunction. All right. And I had a case of Strider uh, that was about two years ago, and it was a lung, it was a cancer yep. of the of the trachea. Vocal cords. Yep. And I'd like to add that in the emergency department setting, uh, when I see or hear somebody who is having Strider, that is a an emergency. That's something I got to deal with right now. Um, whereas okay. somebody who's wheezing, it definitely needs to be taken care of, but it's not as time Dangerous. sensitive. So let's talk about epiglottitis and kids with Strider. Explain that. Uh, so epiglottitis is an inflammation of the epiglottis, which is an area kind of behind your tongue, um, and that helps to uh, close your airway when you're swallowing. That's a normal thing that it does. You know, it just and flaps down. You swallow, it flaps down, and the food goes into your lungs. I mean, the food goes in your esophagus, not. not into your lungs. And when that epiglottis isn't working, it goes down the wrong tube. Yeah, so you can imagine that the epiglottis is right there in the airway. And if it gets swollen, or edematous, we might call it, uh, then it can start causing blockage in the airway. And like you both mentioned earlier, when you get that upper airway obstruction, you can have strider, and that's very uh, sick and Those are the possibly kids critical. Can, the, the kitties can die. But it isn't epiglottitis most of the time when kids are having strider, what is it? Well, they have like a tracheitis or a paratracheitis kind of a thing. And 90% and of the time it's virus, right? Yes. So what One do you more. do? Well, you give them supportive care and a lot of education. Right. I, I remember collapsing lungs. I mean, I've seen the chest wall collapse as they are inhaling and they're, they're sucking to try to get the air in and their trachea is sick and their, lung, their chest wall falls all the way back to their... <laughs> yes, uh, we call that retractions and that's a, that's a big deal too. I mean, there's some that are minor and we can deal with that, but um, there's various places in the body that we look and see those and just another bit of evidence that, okay, this child is sick and in need of something right away. I'd also like to say that the uh, Haemophilus, uh, in, what, what's the, HIB. yeah, the, the HIB vaccine, I guess would be, has been very big in helping us in the emergency department to, because it decreases the incidence of epiglottitis tremendously. So in those patients who have that, it's very helpful uh, for us to know that they're less likely going to be having epiglottitis and more likely to be having something else, maybe a viral kind of a problem. But when we ask parents and they say, oh, you know, we didn't vaccinate for whatever reason, then our, our concern is much higher for that child and, and their risk is much higher. So you've, you've made a point about the vaccination. Do you want to nail that uh, vaccination point one more time? Sure. So uh, I won't necessarily talk about pediatrics and vaccinations. Those are very important, but uh, particularly in adults, influenza vaccination is critical. All of us need Need to get the flu vaccine. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the science behind vaccination, we have a good example of when you don't vaccinate a population, um, like the bird flu uh, that hit the chickens and the turkeys in the upper Midwest. Um, it went through them and, and many died. Um, it would be similar in humans if we didn't have flu vaccination. And so, despite what you might hear in the popular media about the harms of vaccination. None of that's proven, and the benefits are true. We all need to get the flu vaccine every year. All right. Breathing distress can be caused by many factors at any age. It's important to find out what triggers your breathing distress. 
The first, and I think it's the only attack I've ever had, I was on a run with a friend and we were outside because my asthma is triggered not necessarily by uh, physical exercise but my allergens because I have really bad allergies. And so what we concluded later happened is that I ran through something that I was allergic to, whether it was pollen or dust or something like that. And it went from very quickly just being like breathing heavily because I was on a run to not being able to breathe at all. And so I immediately stopped running and bent over and was like, Ugh, like just wheezing really, really heavily. And it was really scary, um, especially because at that time I didn't really know much about asthma and didn't think that I had it. And that was kind of a definite turning point. It was like, okay, something just caused me to not be able to breathe. We did a breathing test, so it's like a four-stage test, and you do, uh, it's like to measure your lung capacity, and you have a starting point, and you do that, and they measure your lung capacity, and then they introduce you to um, some kind of allergen or something that will trigger an asthma attack, and they do that in four steps, and after each step, they measure uh, your lung capacity after that, and for me, they did the first two sets, and I'd already lost like it was like 63% of my lung capacity. So they halted that, and they're like, "Okay, you're very obviously an asthmatic." Um, and we went through some like different types of inhalers, um, different allergy meds too, because mine's really closely tied with my allergies. And we kind of concluded what would be the best practice and method for me to handle it. And we decided, since it was a pretty severe case of asthma, to do a strong maintenance inhaler four times a day, every day. And then I had an emergency inhaler for situations like when I was on the run or before exercise or if I'm feeling sick, to use that one accordingly. Um, and so, and I've gone back and we've changed the medicines I take and stuff just to f fit my lifestyle more. It's pretty controlled. It flares up when I get sick or during allergy season, but it's not anywhere near what it used to be. I had a, the sinus surgery a few years ago, and that really helped um, just kind of because like my sinuses and my allergies and my asthma are all kind of tied together. So the, between that and the maintenance inhalers and stuff like that, I've really been able to get a handle on it. And um, I'm not afraid of running anymore. It's not something that I worry about, and allergy season's not nearly as stressful. And Asthma is something that we physicians almost all uh, have to know a great deal about. Uh, do you see a fair amount of asthma in the, in the emergency room, Ben? Yes, we do. A lot of asthma, more than I'd like to. Um, but uh, uh, it, it is one of our more popular. Prevalent is probably the Prevalent, better way to say right. it than popular. And what percentage of those people get admitted to the hospital? A very small percentage. But some of them do. Yep. And they are sick, ick, and, mm. and people die from asthma. Yes, when when they're sick, uh, you better deal with it fast. Uh, she she talked about using a steroid inhaler and then doing a beta agonist rescue. To explain sure. those two different treatments. Yeah. So asthma, she did a nice job of explaining it related to allergies. Usually, um, people are born with a tendency towards it in most instances, but it can be acquired later in life too. Manifests as shortness of breath with activity or due to other triggers, cough and wheeze. Um, we, we, we manage asthma based on its severity from intermittent disease to persistent disease, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. In patients who have persistent disease, they should be using a, a maintenance therapy, typically an inhaled steroid. That's what we call the, the building block or the cornerstone upon which all other therapy is built. Sometimes medicines like she showed, um, Singular or Montelukast, and then when, when their symptoms aren't well controlled, when they're having an exacerbation, when they end up in the ER um, with Benjamin, is when the beta agonist becomes important. That's the albuterol, neb, or inhaler. That's their rescue drug. It's not meant to control their disease, but it's the only way to treat their acute symptoms. And so, so you have maintenance therapy, inhaled steroids primarily, and then your beta agonists, at least the short acting, are for rescue maintenance. Right, and it's interesting that they've purposes. combined the long-acting beta agonists with the steroid, primarily like asthma court, I mean, uh, uh, Advair, Advair Simbacort, Sim Dulera, and the newest is Brio, the Elliptis system. Right. And so those are a combination of both inhaled steroid and what's called a long-acting beta agonist, different than your albuterols or your Zolpinexes. Right. And those, again, are maintenance therapies for more moderate or severe asthma as opposed to less severe disease. And the reason that they, and they're expensive, but the reason that uh, some of us use those 
is because they trick people into actually taking their steroid inhaler. I mean, am I wrong? No, you're not, you're not wrong. So steroid inhalers don't provide relief from acute symptoms. They're designed to control the disease. They're, they're still critical. They're the most important part because they, they prevent the inflammation, which is what drives asthma. And, and when Benjamin gets a case of a severe asthmatic who's not taking their maintenance medicines, he has that much more of a difficult time controlling that acute exacerbation because they're not taking their maintenance therapy. Right. And that's the biggest challenge is the asthmatic who feels well doesn't see a need to use their, their maintenance therapy, but they must because if they do not, when they, they have, have that exacerbation, they end up in Benjamin's in, in trouble. It's yeah, a steroid, it's maintenance steroid inhaled steroid. It doesn't cause you generally a lot of systemic problems, and it protects you from that asthma. It's very it's important. Critical. And it's hard to get those right. And, I, you know, probably the second biggest uh, cause of, in, in my experience of seeing patients with asthma, is that they have somehow not been educated or don't know how to take their medications correctly. They might be, um, rather than using the rescue inhaler, they might be using their long-acting inhaler that they're supposed to take daily as a rescue medicine and taking them backwards. Now, the most common cause is that they run out of medication. That's a big one. And they don't, run and out. it's so darn expensive that they yep, don't fill for it. For various reasons, or it's middle yeah. of the night. Or Maybe whatever. we can fix that one day when we get the system set up where everybody has reasonably priced medicines. That's another story. Let's jump to the questions, but that was a great picture of asthma and her story, you know, of having it triggered and, and important again that the steroids are the deal. That's right. And it works. Uh, let me, one more question. Yeah. So people who have asthma versus chronic bronchitis versus emphysema, those are three different physio physiologies, different pathophysiology, as they say, the reason that they have the obstruction, but they all wheeze. And the treatments are pretty much pretty close to the same thing, although for people who have emphysema and are really very dilated, uh, they want to go with something like Spiriva. Yeah. So I'll just try to explain it relatively quickly. You know, asthma is a reversible form of airflow obstruction that sometimes uh, manifests as wheezing, but at other times is normal. COPD patients have chronic shortness of breath all the time long-acting muscarinic antagonists, the, the, the bronchodilators like Spiriva, Tudorza, Stialto, the newest versions of those, those are reserved for our COPD patients, not for our asthma sufferers. Inhaled steroids play a, a less important role in COPD. They're really only for your COPD patient who has, um, Some has, asthma. has severe um, obstructive airway disease with an FEV1. Again, a breathing test is very important in patients who have symptoms of cough or shortness of breath. That's one thing to tell your doctor, um, I'm, I'm chronically short of breath or coughing, he needs to get you or she needs to get you to a spirometry. And then if you have severe airflow obstruction and recurrent exacerbations manifest by visits to the doctor or hospital, that's where inhaled steroids work in COPD. So inhaled steroids are most important for asthma, bronchodilators, the long acting ones are most important in COPD. Spirometry is critical. If you have chronic cough or shortness of breath, that's what your doctor needs to encourage you to do, is so a spirometry. You, you need, if you got those kinds of problems, you need to have a good doctor guiding you through them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a 73-year-old from Madison. I have cardiomyopathy, and a friend of mine told me that using a CPAP machine is hard on my heart. Is that true? I'm, I'm going to just quickly state something, and I'm going to let Benjamin comment on CPAP in heart failure. CPAP can be very helpful for patients with heart failure, but there's been some recent, there was a recent study using a special mode of positive airway pressure, not CPAP, but a special mode different from CPAP that showed potentially increased mortality in patients with cardiomyopathy. More death rate. Yeah, and that, that's not relevant to a, a typical CPAP user. C, sleep apnea, if not treated, will make sleep, will make cardiomyopathy much worse. And so this individual who has a standard CPAP, I assume, or a BiPAP, a standard one, not one of these special machines, needs to use that device. And, and I'll defer to Benjamin about the role for CPAP in patients with acute heart failure. Sure. Um, in the emergency department, you know, we're deciding relatively quickly about who is going to need to have something to help them breathe. And as I said earlier, is it oxygen? Is it something more than that? And when a person is starting to get into the realm where they're getting tired out, 
or something's making it so they just can't get that air in and out and their vital signs are getting abnormal, that's when I say, well, I've got to intervene. And so then I decide, are the risks versus the benefits? Uh, is the risk higher or the benefit higher? And many times, I will opt to go ahead and use uh, CPAP or what Mike had said, the BiPAP, which is a little bit different modality on that. Yeah, that's where you, you really push the air in automatically instead of yep. when you breathe in, you're just breathing with a higher pressure. Yeah, so CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. It's just basically you've got a fan blowing through a tube at your face and you put a mask on your face and that helps to have a seal that blows that air in. It's and opens the airways. Right, for various physiological reasons, it keeps the airway open and doesn't keep the air in, you can still overcome that and push air out when you're blowing out. So BiPAP or bi-level uh, uh, positive airway pressure detects when you're inhaling and it'll increase the pressure, give you a little extra puff. And so uh, as far as I know, Mike, you can correct me, that I don't know that that's ever been proven to give any additional benefit, we just think it probably does. But I use it because most of my colleagues use it and it seems to be helpful to patients. But I, in the, sorry, ahead. in those cases um, where, you know, we're, 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 either, we're either putting them on a ventilator or we're gonna do something else, I'm using the CPAP, I'm using the BiPAP. And see if they can get by and then you put them on the ventilator if it fails. Long answer to the quick question. Yes, and the, and the point is that it, when a person is pooping out and they're going down the tube and their CO2, you know, the poison that you builds up is going up and you're failing, you put them on the ventilator, even with heart failure. Sure. Yep. And it works. And for this gentleman, I just say keep using your CPAP and, and talk to your provider about your concerns about the cardiomyopathy with the CPAP. So, you know, the Australian study shows that normal people. Uh, the, the, from uh, 30 to 65 years of age, over 13 years of age, uh, 13 years, there was a 6% 6 death rate. People who had obstructive uh, 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 pulmonary or sleep apnea had a 33% death rate. Yep. So there's a huge difference in the death rate of people who have true obstructive uh, airways disease when they're trying when they're when they're asleep sleep apnea so C CPAP is lifesaver mm -hmm. yep, and it's, you know we're not talking about COPD CPAP's not for COPD BiPAP can be but C sleep CPAP apnea. for sleep apnea OSA or sleep apnea that's right. uh, we have uh, so CPAP is not necessarily hard on your heart may no, well be good. very good for your heart 65 year old woman from Yankton, please explain bronchoscopy risks and other issues. I had one as a kid to remove a peanut and have had an issue with a rough sounding cough for my whole life. Everything I got, every time I got a cold, my doctor said bronchoscopy may uh, have caused this due to a hole in the lung left by the scope. Yeah, I do a lot of bronchoscopy um, and I would say that this is a misunderstanding. There's no possible way I think that the bronchoscopy could have caused her problem with chronic cough. It won't cause a hole in her lung. Um, removing the peanut was important. Uh, peanuts are very caustic to the airway. I've removed several on my myself and if you leave them there then you've got serious issues down the road. Foreign body granulation, inflammation. And so, my guess is that's what happened. Yeah. Not, the whole peanut didn't get removed yep. and there was foreign very body Very possible but unrelated to the bronchoscopy. It wasn't the bronchoscopy. Correct. There is risk to bronchoscopy. Sure. What Very is it? small. Well, you know, bronchoscopies again. It's an it's a relatively non-invasive procedure where we use a fiber optic scope, a, a, a scope with a just camera like the colonoscopy, yeah, only a, a different scope, different actually. area of the body. Um, and we go in through the uh, breathing tube into the lungs. Um, patients can be awake, but we often do them asleep. Um, and we can examine the airway um, with looking the camera. Looking for cancer, mostly. Yeah, looking for those sorts of things or... Peanuts. Uh, yep, or foreign bodies. And then we can also biopsy areas of the lung. Um, we can do it with ultrasound guidance. And, and so it's a very helpful procedure for patients who have chronic lung disease, who may have aspirated or inhaled something, or for those who have a, a potential cancer for diagnostic purposes. The biggest risks are when I biopsy your lung, it could collapse. That's pretty small, one in a hundred. Bleeding can be a problem not very often. And then, you know, adverse reactions to being put on sedative medicines. It's a All very right. safe procedure. Bronchoscopy. Mm -hmm. Do you do bronchoscopy? Nope. Um, and it would be rare that I would uh, have a patient that needs one unless you have a person like this who we're concerned that there's something in the airway and it's causing them some difficulty. And breathing. then you call him and he comes in. And I in. call him in. Yeah, there you Thank go. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's easy to think that you have come down with the influenza or a cold and you'll get over it. But if it doesn't get better or keeps getting worse, seek medical help.
and it was mainly just uh, a bad cough and, and b trouble breathing and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, I just didn't go to the doctor as I should. And what really happened is the pneumonia turned septic. And that's a very tough virus. Uh, it shut down all my organs, uh, shut down bone marrow. Uh, basically, the only thing left working was my heart a little bit. My oldest daughter was trying to talk to me and she couldn't get a hold of me, so she stopped at my house. And at that time, I was already in really tough medical shape. And within 10 minutes, I was in the hospital in Brookings. Probably 10 minutes after that, I was either dead or unconscious. They helicoptered me into Sioux Falls, and I didn't wake up for six weeks. In that time, I was in the ICU and in a coma, and they were doing everything they could to get things to work again. I came out of that on dialysis for a while. I had no real blood work going because my bone marrow wasn't working. I lost all physical function. I lost about 70 pounds uh, while I was in the hospital. Uh, finally, after six weeks, I made it out of ICU. I'm a bicycle rider, which is probably one of the reasons I'm still alive because when I went into the hospital, I was in very good athletic condition for my age. I mean, when I got to Brookings, I looked down and, and I had no calves left. I mean, I had lost all muscle function. I couldn't walk. I couldn't feed myself. Um, I also, because I was on the feeding tube so long, I got diabetes. And all of that stuff cleared up. And I did not really rebound physically until they put, I had to have a couple pints of blood and that seemed to get everything started where I could then get more physical and uh, rehabilitation went better after that and I was out of there in 30 days. I am more aware of, of if I'm not feeling good, if I don't get over it in a week to 10 days, I'm, I'm going in. Uh, and I encourage other people to do that. Well, we thank my dear friend Dave Dodson for her willingness to tell us our story uh, and so glad that he survived. They, we, we were all hanging on the fact that they gave him 10% chance of making it through. He was so septic, so and low blood pressure. You've seen that story before, Ben. What, tell me more about what is a typical sepsis story. Yeah, in the emergency department, we see it. Um, we see a person who has sepsis fairly commonly, and we need to be able to differentiate somebody who's septic from somebody who's got something else going septic on. Septic meaning? Uh, septic meaning that they have some uh, organs in their body not functioning properly because of an illness or a bacterial infection. Maybe it could be viral infection too, uh, but we commonly think of it as bacterial, and we generally are very aggressive with our treatment nowadays for that. And so we need to recognize that quickly and begin treatment quickly for that. And uh, maybe I'll uh, leave it up to Mike to tell us all the modalities, but obviously antibiotics and IV fluids are necessary, and then getting them to the proper care. As in Dave's case, he got flown uh, to a hospital that could take care of him uh, in a more critical sort of a fashion, uh, getting him to doctors such as pulmonologists who can take care of them long term, an intensive care unit who can do that. And in the emergency department, it's recognizing that that needs to be done early. Yeah, quickly, anything to add? Well, I think it's critical. Benjamin and his colleagues are specialists in managing sepsis as it first presents, and they have developed protocols that are very helpful in recognizing certain SIRS criteria, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome and so they have ways their nurses collect that data right away vital signs and other indications some preliminary lab data that then triggers them to to start the sepsis treatment and then once they've got the patient stabilized you know in Yankton we have a full service intensive care unit they bring him over to us and we go along with the next six hours of therapy and again the critical feature is to recognize sepsis and, and let Benjamin and his colleagues in the emergency department start the treatments that prevent death. And, you know, your friend Dave was very lucky to, to have survived that. And um, we've come a long way with sepsis. Survival rates are increasing dramatically because of what they're doing primarily in the emergency department in that first six hours. So he had a viral infection, and then over a period of time, he de developed a secondary bacterial infection. So when do you know that you treat with an antibiotic 
versus when do you not treat with an antibiotic? And I'll, I'll give that back to Ben. I should say, uh, Rick, that we do see that a lot, you yes. know, with, especially with influenza. People want an antibiotic because they think that they're going to get better from it. Yep, um, and, and it is uh, common enough that people do get really sick and need to have an antibiotic. And so it's very difficult if you are the patient who's at home and you're sick and you're wondering how, you know, how sick am I? Do I need to have an antibiotic? You know, we'd rather have you come and see us and have us evaluate you in the emergency department. And, you know, the, the vast majority of patients who have that illness are able to go home and they have a viral infection that's not causing them to have this horrible bacterial infection later on. And we can treat them conservatively or uh, basically treat their symptoms and not have to use an antibiotic. And hopefully we'll be able to talk about that a little bit later on the, the risks of antibiotics. The, the quick uh, nitty gritty, they get a fever, they have chills, they have a sore throat, they have a hacky, hacky cough, that goes away in a day or two and then they have a cough for two weeks. No matter how, what you do, they're gonna, it's just gonna be two weeks. If they get that fever again in two or three or four or five days, would you say that's a good summary? Sure, I think the critical thing to keep in mind is, is fever does not mean you need an antibiotic. Cough and sputum don't mean you need an antibiotic. Those are symptoms that are, e that are equal in viral and bacterial infections. And most of us, if we're healthy, it's gonna be a virus and our body will handle it without the antibiotic. And in fact, there's potential complications of that antibiotic therapy. Things as serious Bad. as C. difficile colitis, which Bad. is a diarrhea illness. And I'm sure some of our listeners have had family members or themselves who've suffered from that. Or um, simply other less severe conditions or selecting out you know, bacteria that will become resistant to that that antibiotic. So if you're healthy at baseline, you don't have major medical problems, and you have common cold symptoms, your best bet's to just treat it symptomatically. Stay out of the clinic if you can. There's don't go to school sick. or work. Yep, stay home and rest. Fluids and rest make as big a difference as any antibiotic and um, ever will, and they won't hurt you. Throat just lozenges. remember the hospital is full of bugs that you That's can pick yeah, up. Yeah, don't go there. <laughs> you can help. 71-year-old from uh, Lake Wilson, Minnesota, was in the emergency room, put into the hospital in Sioux Falls for six days, and was diagnosed with a stomach that had turned with an air sac in her stomach. Uh, what caused that, and does it go away on its own? An air sac in the stomach? I don't know if she had a volvulus. Hmm. Or if it was actually her stomach. Yeah, I think we kind of need a little more information. Was that <laughs> found on that, an X-ray? Uh, that is. I wonder uh, if the question maybe it was a, a hiatal hernia. Mm -hmm. So uh, the hiatal hernia would go away. It would not go away on its own, but it's generally not harmful. That's when the stomach slides up into the chest through the diaphragm. Congenitally, she, I mean, you have yeah. it all the time. I yeah, mean, but if she had a volvulus, which is a little lower than the stomach, that oftentimes will resolve on its own, but sometimes can indicate a. a, a a condition that needs definitive treatment by surgery. Hard to know for sure. What did we Hard say the age was? I missed She that. was 60, 71. 71. All right. So. A male caller from Centerville. What happens when a person has a collapsed lung? A former SDSU football player is playing in a game, broke some ribs, caused a collapsed lung. You, that's an emergency rule. Yes, um, uh, a case, the patient who has that is a really interesting patient. I mean, we like to be able to help them because a lot of times we can intervene and help them right away. Um, but there are degrees of collapsed lung and how bad it is. The majority of patients have a small collapsed lung. We call it a pneumothorax. So we might look at it on an x-ray and we might see that there's just this little bit of air in the wrong place. And air is where uh, is outside of the lung, but inside of the chest wall. So maybe you have a picture of that, I don't know. Well, and then you have, this air is outside the lung, and so you see this. Mm -hmm. That looks like a, a pretty big one there. This, this drawer is, this drawing thing is not working well, but it's, <laughs> I can do it from the side. Mm -hmm. So so I would probably want to do something about that. Uh, and that generally will involve the placement of something called a chest tube. And again, depending on how critical that person is, we'll decide what type of chest tube, and that's probably outside of the scope of what we need to do today, but and we'll so, put one in and send him to Mike. Yeah, this was Zach Zenner, um, who was our you know, the, oh. the greatest running back in the history He's of now SDSU, playing, playing for the Detroit Lions, or was, and, and was doing well and had a, uh, got hit hard in the chest and it fractured some ribs, and either the trauma or potentially the rib fractures themselves punctured his lung and allowed the air to escape into the chest wall, into the chest itself, where there's nowhere for it to escape 
outside of the body, and so it pushes against the lung, collapsing the lung by tension. He never tension did have a, pneumothorax. He didn't have a tension pneumothorax, but was progressing towards that. And what Benjamin will do in the emergency department, and Benjamin is very skilled in invasive procedures, is put um, typically now a small tube between the ribs to expel that air from the chest cavity and let that lung re-expand. And we, we see it on TV drama where they put a pen you can do it. Casing and you let that air out or a needle. And I have not done that before. I have done it one Me time. Today. Congratulations. Uh, so 35 year old woman from Rapid City, how does secondhand smoke affect asthmatic patients compared to a healthy person? Ooh. Yeah, so secondhand smoke is harmful in all of, uh, in all cases. Um, that's proven. Do you think that they've blown that up, though? I mean, people. Um, I don't think so. I don't think that there's. I don't think they've overblown that. Secondhand smoke is a real deal. Um, is a real deal. It's not your right to expose other people to secondhand smoke. So in public places, smoking shouldn't be permitted. Um, and I have seen more than one wife of a heavy smoker die of cancer. Absolutely. It's a, it's a true risk factor for lung cancer, for COPD, and in asthmatic patients, smoke is a particularly noxious stimulant, and they can have a, a, a severe reaction to it. And so it's not good for anyone to, to breathe secondhand smoke, but asthmatic patients in particular should not be exposed um, to secondhand smoke or even other particulate matter. And so if you have asthma, be careful about your occupation because you could harm yourself. And please be respectful of your partner and don't expose that person. Smoke outside if you if you will. And one more thing for children as well. Even if you do smoke outside, a lot of those carcinogens are still on your clothes and so your children can be sick because of that too. So change the clothes or better yet, stop smoking. So, and to sm stop smoking, we have a South Dakota Squits uh, graphic that talks about what to do? Do you know more about this? You call that number? It's wonderful. one south dakota quits They're going to help you. When, you're, when you've decided you want to make that attempt, this is your best option. They'll, they'll discuss with you how you want to handle going through it. They're not going to direct you or force you to do anything. They're just there to benefit you as you try to quit. And we know patients who go through counseling with the quit line, who use nicotine replacement, and you, who take a medicine designed to help them quit smoking are much more successful than those who try to quit on their own. And if they quit smoking, their, their respiratory illnesses reduce. I mean, they get better. I mean, the chances of uh, cancer of the lung reduces every year yep. after you quit. There's yep. a reason to do it. 61-year-old from Aberdeen, I have COPD and asthma. I was taking Flonase and Advair at the same time. Uh, and now you've, I've developed thrush. Could the doctor shed some light on thrush? Ben? Sure. Yeah, uh, thrush is a fungal infection that happens uh, generally in the mouth. I think it is thrush is, is in the mouth only, but or in the throat, so I suppose. Um, and it is painful and just generally a not fun thing to have. Um, most people who don't have any problems with their immune system just don't get thrush. It doesn't happen. But the uh, Advair and the Flonase are both steroids, and steroids essentially suppress your immune system to a certain degree. And those are administered. The Flonase is given by a snort in the nose, and Advair is a puff in the mouth. And so it's coating those areas. With steroid. With steroid. And so those areas then don't have their immune system working very well, and you can get thrush there. So the best thing other than treatment of the thrush itself is to really be careful when you're using those. Rinse your mouth rinse out your mouth. afterward. Now the nose right. is a little bit tougher. All right. I haven't heard of anybody with Flonase alone getting thrush. No, yeah, and that, but there could be that they're a little bit diabetic and that, diabetic that sets it up. And too. you can treat it very quickly and, and there's oral things and there's a tablet that you can take it. So it's, you shouldn't sit with the, it. I think the critical point for her is to really rinse her mouth with that Advair and then you know, use the lowest dose of inhaled steroid possible to control asthma symptoms. And be sure your doctor checks you from uh, some other immune uh, problem. So as while we're talking about immunity, let's talk about pneumonia vaccine, Prevnar vaccine, Pneumovax, Prevnar, what are they, who gets it, and when, what's the timing for that? I don't know that you do a lot of vaccination in the emergency I guess this is your baby. Yeah. A lot. That's about it. So we've always, for years, for decades, we've had the pneumovax, which is a, uh, is a polysaccharide vaccination, conjugated poly, or non-conjugated polysaccharide vaccination against pneumococcal pneumonia, the most common bacterial cause of pneumonia. And it's something that, that patients who have chronic heart or lung or kidney disease or, or whose immune system otherwise aren't functioning well should get right away. And then at age 65, everyone's been recommended to get the pneumovax. 
um, age 65 and above. Now there's a, a, a newer vaccination known as Prevnar 13, which is a conjugated vaccination. It's more antigenic. The body responds with a more brisk immune response. And it's now recommended for all patients over 65. So if you're 65 or older and have not had Prevnar, talk to your doctor about getting Prevnar. Prevnar is not recommended for the general patient population less than 65. There are a few select patients with serious immune problems like no spleen or, or other very serious immune problems that are also um, advised to get Prevnar. So the, the guideline that I would say to follow is if you're 65 or older, you, get, you need to get the Prevnar vaccine. If you're 65 or younger and you think you might be qualified for it, talk to your doctor about it. The way I'm advising is Pneumovax, I mean, uh, Medicare will pay for both. Yep. So I generally start with the Pneumovax, a year later give them the Prevnar. And the current guidelines, I'm not trying to correct your no. practice, would say if you're 65 and haven't had either, get the Prevnar first, and then 12 months later get the Pneumovax. Okay. And then five years later, um, you would have a booster of the Pneumovax if you got Pneumovax initially before you were 65. But the, it's confusing. So the take home is if you're 65 or older and you've not been vaccinated for pneumonia, go to your doctor, he'll give you the Prevnar. One year later, you'll get the Pneumovax and you're done. It's not like the flu vaccine. It's so, one time of each of those. So it's interesting. There was an article in the, I, don't, I think it was the New England Journal of Medicine that said 10,000 people last year was saved by Prevnar. They were elderly people. They didn't get the Prevnar vaccine. All those kitties got it, and the kitties had herd immunity, and they're the ones with the snotty nose and the colds, and the uh, and they give it to the older people. Sure. And the Prevnar and the kids saved all those older people. And, and that's where I just say, you know, just because you're healthy and don't think you're going to suffer significantly from an infection by the flu or the pneumonia doesn't mean you shouldn't be vaccinated because we're not trying to protect you every time. We're trying to protect the population that you're exposed to. Particularly the people who are on chemotherapy or they have illness or asthma or set up for problems. So it's not about you. Right. It, do it for your friends, your family, people who are sick around you. Someone with a uh, 77-year-old male from Brookings, I'm affected with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, a terminal diagnosis. Mayo told me it's related to being born premature. What research exists? We've got a quick minute. Okay, well, I'm a, a specialist. I take care of pulmonary fibrosis all the time. I doubt it was related. If it's true pulmonary fibrosis, not likely related to being a preterm baby, potentially increase the risk. Um, it is, a, unfortunately, a progressive, gradual disease that often results in death. But there are a couple of treatments now available, antifibrotic therapies. And I, you know, I trained at Mayo. My colleagues in pulmonology there are very familiar with that. And hopefully he's been at least introduced to that treatment option. Okay, uh, steroids? Um, they're not. They're not helpful. Steroids don't benefit. Um, true idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And I've seen some of these people just not get any worse. They just get it, they're there, mm -hmm. they live a long, long time and die of, you know, 98 year old or something. It's important, else. I think, in that patient to get them to a, a lung specialist to di differentiate who's got, you know, true idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and who's got other conditions. Uh, we've got a question, 61 year old from Rapid, what, what are the normal oxygen levels? What are the better health risks associated with VAP pens? Is it better to smoke tobacco or VAP? Well, all right, so deal with this a lot. Um, so oxygen levels, I assume seconds. that he's talking about pulse oximetry, 90 to 100%, probably 92 to 100%. Uh, risks associated with the, va the VAP pens, uh, we don't know all of them. We think that maybe they're less, but we do think that they are harmful to you. So I know, I'd some people are able to quit, them. though, to use, and so it helps them. <laughs> Controversial. We've got to go to this. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question, true or false, a person with emphysema now commonly called COPD or CO... Uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, a person with asthma, both have trouble pushing the air out of the lungs, but not so much trouble getting it in. True or false? Answer is true. It was Larry Goodroad who correctly answered our question and who is, I might tell you, a very good deer hunter. Thank you, Larry, for your answer. The book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. Sorry, flu. You're not you when you have the flu. 
get vaccinated because stopping the flu starts with you. Defining the causes for breathlessness or troubled breathing illustrates how perplexing it can be making the right diagnosis when someone has a medical problem. It was a party night while I was in college when someone's date was rushed into my dorm room, gasping and breathing rapidly, asking if I could help her. Someone must have known that I had had asthma when younger and that I might be able to help this desperate young woman. She seemed extremely anxious, and I remember trying to reassure her under unsuccessfully. I think she eventually had to go to the local emergency room and everything eventually turned out okay. Years later, in medical school during a lecture on lung conditions, I remembered the young lady with the rapid breathing experience years earlier and realized that she likely had breathlessness from anxiety and hyperventilation and not from asthma or any other respiratory illness. Since then, I have seen hyperventilation syndrome occur in many more people, mostly while I was working in the emergency room. It's important to realize this condition is a real deal. Anxiety-driven overbreathing causes the body's pH balance to go way out of whack, resulting in numbness and even severe spasticity of the extremities, which in turn makes the patient even more frightened. One common treatment is to have the person rebreathe into a paper bag to normalize the acid base or pH balance of the blood. I prefer having the patient go for a brisk walk, which reassures the patient they're not so sick and works as well in returning the blood pH to normal. Most of the other causes for dyspnea or shortness of breath are not so easy to fix. The following list, which is not complete, illustrates how diverse and varied the causes for breathlessness can be. Obstructive lung disease, like asthma or chronic bronchitis or emphysema, infections like viral influenza or bacterial pneumonia, excessive fluid and swelling within the lung, like congestive heart failure or lung edema from lung infection, too much acid in the blood, like diabetes out of control or with certain kinds of poisoning, and lung wall lining irritation, like viral pleuritis or embolic blood clots to the lung. In addition, think how anxiety and hyperventilation might make all these problems seem worse. So when you run into someone who's having trouble breathing, the one thing you know for sure is that it could be from many causes. Maybe just a little anxiety, maybe something really bad, or maybe both. Bottom line, when breathless, always seek help. Well, a heartfelt thank you to our studio guests, Mike Pietela and Ben Aker. Their insight breathed life into our show tonight. And thanks to you at home as well. We generally appreciate your participation in our discussion. A program note, due to the Thanksgiving holiday and fundraising on South Dakota Public Television, On Call with the Prairie Doc will not be on again until December 10th. Please do consider supporting SDP TV during their drive. They are a vital partner and a good friend of this show. We're in flu season. Take a look at the chart. We are just getting to the part where the flu season, where cases begin to take off. Don't delay. Get your influenza vaccine now to reduce your chances of spending time with the flu bug or spreading it. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Thankfully, things have changed. Surgery in the 21st century. Next time, on call with The Prairie Doc. Funding for On Call with The Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call.
on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Swiftel Communications, and Vance Thompson Vision. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call After Hours, where we answer the questions we weren't able to get to during the broadcast portion of our show. All your questions are important to us and we want to answer as many as we can, so here we go. Female patient from Piedmont, is it possible for my 14-year-old grandson who has a lot of allergies to contract croup? Yes. Yeah. And to, I mean, it, what is croup? Croup is an inflammation in the upper part of the airway. Uh, it can come from a lot of different things, generally viral. It's actually the para-influenza virus is a big one. It's not the flu, um, but it does cause a person, a, even a child, to have this kind of a, what we call a croupy cough. Sounds like a seal barking maybe. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and strider. And sometimes strider, yeah. So there's a continuum. It can get really bad. It can get really sick. Most of them that we see are kind of right in the middle of the road. And I treat them with a steroid medication and generally let them go home an hour later. Okay. What's the difference between that and whooping cough? Well, whooping cough is caused by a bacterial infection um, and the pertussis uh, bacteria. And it's, a, it's a, a different mechanism of triggering it. And with whooping cough, it's a persistent cough that leads to vomiting in many instances. Um, they <gasps> whoop during the cough, but it's a different form of inflammation. And, and whooping cough is much different and more serious typically and requires treatment with an antibiotic to prevent more serious complications down the road. And can you prevent it with a vaccine? Yes. Yep. So the vaccine DPT prevents is critical. Pertussis. But despite yeah. that, a couple of years ago we had an Yeah, it was, so the or? immunity wasn't where it needed to be in a certain population of uh, patients. But it's what generally you get pertussis when you get diphtheria and, and uh, tetanus shots. So Everybody do, gets yep, a tetanus shot. I do vaccinate them for that a lot yep. of things. Yep. All right. So you're okay. the guy who I helps am. prevent that. You're welcome. Uh, so that, that was your cancer. 14-year-old croup? 14-year-old croup? Well, as you get older, your airway gets larger, and that swelling or edema there doesn't uh, cause the sound change as much. So but the para-influenza. Oh, you know, they can definitely get it. So we just kind of think we have a cold. Right, and I'd postulate that that's been what we are seeing this fall. I don't know if you're seeing it in Brookings, but in Yankton we're seeing yep. lots of adults with two to three to five weeks of cough and, and, and difficulty. And it probably it's, para I think it's para-influenza, yeah. I honestly do. We don't test for it, but I think these. I think that's what's going through okay. our adult population. 66-year-old from Mitchell, what is pneumonia and the different types, and how do people get it, and how can it be treated? Pneumonia, what is pneumonia, the different types? 
An infection in the lung, generally. And um, it can be a lot of different... I would say, yeah, all kinds of... bacteria. All kinds of different types. But I think, I think what the questioner is wondering is it could be bacterial, could it be viral, uh, could it be fungal. There's all kinds of different things. It could be an immune process doing that as well. Um, but it's an inflammation in the lungs, even though we generally think of it, well, it's a bacterial infection. It's not always. It doesn't always be treated with antibiotics. Okay. Yeah, so pneumonia, there's, it, it, we talk about the pneumonia vaccine, and I always have patients say, well, why did I get pneumonia? I've had the vaccination. The pneumonia vaccine protects you against one particular organism and its serotypes, the different The 23 types, or the 13. Yeah, or the 13, and again, they're mostly duplicate, but that's only one form of pneumonia. There are hundreds of other causes, whether it's bacterial, wide variety of those, viral, wide variety of those, as Benjamin mentioned, fungus, inflammation. So pneumonia itself is a lot of different things. The conventional type is the bacterial sort of pneumonia, fever, cough, productive of purulent sputum or phlegm, right. uh, malaise, fatigue, those sorts of things. 64-year-old uh, woman from uh, Sioux Falls with a severe bronchitis reaction to cigarette smoke Ask what is state law on how far a smoker must stand away from a public building entrance while smoking? <laughs> what is the law? Do you know the law? I That's don't. a good question. I don't know the answer. I don't. You know, you have all these smoking laws in place, so you can't smoke inside the building, but how far away from the front door should people be required to be? You know, in some of our city parks in Yankton, smoking's banned even outdoors. Yeah, 25 feet is what the, the, the discussion in the back rooms, and the, the, they're saying 25 feet. I can tell you, though, no matter how it is, how far it is, you know, you can see it be jogging down the street and a car drives by and you go, phew, they're it's smoking. Not, yeah. And they're, you know, blocks away. And well, you, studies indicate, you know, and, and I think Benjamin can corroborate this, but in, you know, parents who smoke only in their car, for instance, and then they, they transport their children in that same car, they're not smoking at that time. Those children are still at increased risk for adverse events, just Absolutely. like on clothing. And so, just it's you know, amazing. if you say I only smoke when in my car when my kids aren't there, they're still harmful to those children, even when you're in the vehicle not smoking. So, there you go. 64-year-old, oh, female from Delmont. I have gone through everything that the doctors are talking about. I now have an appointment with the cardiologist. I had the flu and pneumonia at the same time and was hospitalized. I later had C. diff. I've been treated with vancomycin twice. The infectious disease doctor told me I had to be weaned off of vanco, but it's so ex so expensive now. I finally got rid of the C. diff, but now I can't breathe, and I have a diagnosis with atrial fib. She spoke about our doctors being wonderful, uh, and uh, uh, she saw you yesterday. <laughs> Thank you for the show, uh, and she had no question. <laughs> Uh, via email, please talk about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, a genetic condition which is often misdiagnosed as asthma. I have that genetic condition. It was misdiagnosed for year until I, years until I finally had below 10% FEV1% and was thankfully finally diagnosed properly. A double lung transplant seven years ago changed my life. It's not common, but all the doctors and people in the upper Midwest should be very aware of the possibility of their having uh, trouble breathing. Uh, let's talk about antitrypsin, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency very quickly. This is your, your bailiwick. Yeah, this wick. is right in my wheelhouse. So um, alpha-1 antitrypsin is not a rare disease, and it is a inherited cause of um, early onset emphysema. emphysema. It's emphysema. It's you're lacking an enzyme that prevents oxidative injury, that's injury by what you breathe in, to your lung tissue primarily. It can affect liver and things too. And, and the critical thing, the key thing is, any patient presenting with persistent symptoms of shortness of breath or cough suggestive of obstructive pulmonary disease needs that spirometry exam done. And if it shows airflow obstruction and they're young or don't have high risk like a heavy smoker, and even in heavy smokers, they should be offered a simple test. It's a, it's a needle pinprick of the finger. It's free to screen for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And so, especially if there's a history in your family, then it's even more critical. But our, our practitioners need to recognize the potential morbidity associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin. And in those patients who fit that morbidity profile. illnesses. Illnesses, right. right. That's the, just like she describes or he describes the misdiagnosis of asthma, they need to be tested for that alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency because, number one, um, they can be counseled to avoid things that will harm their lungs, like cigarette smoking. Number two, they might be offered replacement therapy. 
Uh, we could have a long discussion about how effective cost benefit that is. And third, they may be a candidate for lung transplantation if they have end stage disease. Right. And I want the caller to understand that this is a question for the smart doctors here. <laughs> when you come into the emergency department, we're going to treat you as you are, you know, how you're breathing. And, and uh, the emergency department rarely, if ever, will make that diagnosis that you have alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. So don't be upset at them for that. We're here to treat you as you are, and we can do that. Do that. I'll give you one comment, though. Uh, I've followed this for a long time, and my sense is that the treatment that we have for alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, deficiency, what data do we have to show that it's made any difference? The data is not strong. So okay, so there's very is, little mm -hmm. data to show any difference that it makes a difference. And how much does it cost a year? It's, it's dramatically expensive to somebody. In many instances, the companies will provide the medication free of charge to the patient. They're billing the insurance company for whatever they can get. But it's it can be, you know, a, along the lines of tens of thousands of dollars per year, without any definite Proof benefit. That it makes without it any help. definite benefit. Uh, it certainly helped when the person had a lung transplant, yes. and that's an issue, of course. Uh, but I have to say, uh, for fairness and looking at the societal good, the cost of these kinds of things, uh, you have to consider cost. Now, I know that the company who gives the treatment are also the one who provide the correct. genetic test for you're free. Correct. Yes, you're correct. So the genetic Just make that point. But you don't, you know, just because you use that company's genetic test doesn't mean you have to use their product or even treat that patient, but it does allow you to make the diagnosis Correct. and then counsel them about the things that matter, which Include, is no smoking and, and might also be, avoiding particulate matter. And it also might be, you know, whether you have babies or not. Uh, yeah, you want to be careful about not passing that on. It's a, it, it's an, we can go autosomal recessive disease, so just because you have it doesn't mean that your children will have it, but you want to know your spouse doesn't. Uh, right. So anyhow. Long story. Yeah. 85-year-old man from Beersford, would it be wise with an artificial knee to exercise on a stationary bike instead of walking? Well, I'm going to say right now that this person should talk to his orthopedic doctor and ask that question to them. Uh, but exercise is great for everybody. Everybody should be exercising in some way that your doctor recommends. Uh, so I wouldn't think that it would necessarily be a bad thing, but everybody's knee is different, everybody's body is different, and your individual doctor who's seen you should be making that decision for you. Right. I, would, I couldn't say it better. But I, I just can't tell you, do them one or the other or both. <laughs> well, I can't tell you how much I do appreciate both of you being here, giving uh, of your time and your expertise. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Rick. And thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all of your questions and the opportunity to answer them. So until next time, stay healthy out there, people. <laughs>